My research uh, topic posed the question, how can grass-based dairy farming remain competitive? <clears throat> In the short time I've got to address you this afternoon, there's probably three key messages from my report and my research which I want to share with you. Firstly, the fact that New Zealand's uh, dairy industry's sustainable competitive advantage, that is low cost, Milk production from pasture is being eroded in relative terms by global producers, milk producers around the world. The second thing I want to reflect on is the issues that the New Zealand dairy industry is facing with environmental externalities. Now I don't have all the solutions to, to these problems and I think we're all grappling with these, but I have a pretty strong view on what those solutions should not look like. Thirdly, I want to talk about the opportunities for the industry to start thinking about positioning ourselves to exploit an alternative competitive advantage, one of differentiating our milk as being grass or pasture fed. As many of you know, the vast majority of the world's milk that sees the inside of a factory is produced and consumed in confinement dairy with corn as a staple feed. Now these systems have their unique own set of challenges, but importantly, they are making significant productivity gains and with a lot of momentum around that. Now there's a number of areas where these gains are occurring. The corn industry, a key driver of in-house livestock systems, is achieving growth in yield output since the 1930s of 2.7% compound annual growth. This is about 10 times more than ryegrass is achieving on a productivity basis. If we were to plot ryegrass on that gra graph, you would barely see it moving. About 0.2% a year for ryegrass. <coughs> this is increasing the availability and lowering the cost of corn as a feed source, not just for dairy, but for all livestock industries. In terms of animal performance, there are a number of strategies leading to improved productivity. The top cow in the US is approaching milk production about five times the average New Zealand cow. This has been driven by genetic gains, the use of sex semen and very high herd turnover, and also the use of highly sophisticated and advanced nutrition strategies. Some total mix rations I observed in these systems had nine to 10 different feed types, uh, all set up to optimise milk output, but also to optimise cost and rationalise cost. And there's also great use of technology in these containment systems where that tech sector is, is geared up for. Robotic milking, cow monitoring, um, and, and such like. Now, as these farms move up the productivity curve, the average cost of milk production reduces making them more competitive with us on a variable cost basis. Now, another important consideration to these systems is fixed cost. So that's the opportunity cost or, or capital cost or asset footprint of a dairy-producing dairy business. Now, the significant appreciation in dairy land that we've had in New Zealand, or all real estate in New Zealand, is now makes us one of the more expensive countries in the world to own a dairy production business. For example, Greenfields, Dairy uh, startups, and, and this is in New Mexico, this is what a dairy conversion looks like, a dirt pen, a couple of water troughs and a feed race. Around about $4,000 a cow with an adjoining uh, cow shed that can milk 24 hours a day. So this is around four times where we're at in New Zealand in terms of uh, that, that asset footprint. Um, now, although their costs as a percentage of gross income are much higher, they're, they're running pretty fine margins, when you adjust for that low capital cost, and adjust for the fact that the cows are doing two and a half to three times more production than ours, some of the profit metrics look pretty compelling, and for that reason there is investment flowing into US dairy, and it's growing. The message here is that, with well, this first point, is that New Zealand's enjoyed some pretty good farm gate returns in the last 10 or 15 years. We've had some supply demand imbalance in our favour, but we can't be complacent about that in the future. The competition's getting organised. To the second point, reflecting on what's happening in New Zealand, I mean, as we all know, Asia's had booming demand for dairy. 
New Zealand uh, farmers have responded in a logical manner <coughs> with uh, a suite of factors, farm gate returns, uh, legislation enabling that, that, that all new milk couldn't be refused, availability of land, capital and water and know-how. So over the past 10 years we've added 10 or 7 billion litres of milk and the national care herd is now over, just over 5 million. So, and there wasn't a lot of regulation over that period as to when or where that occurred, and we've probably done some silly stuff. And we're also learning that this unchecked production-led expansion in the traditional pastoral model is starting to expose some flaws in the system, and that, that's manifesting as loss of nutrients from the farm into the environment, especially in uh, more sensitive catchments and leaky soils. So there's a lot of noise around this, and it's not all dairy's blame, but at the moment our social licence operator is not in a good place. Now we need to get on top of these problems, there's no two ways about it, but I do find it concerning that the suggestion from some quarters is that one of the solutions to this is by pouring concrete and getting cows off paddocks, uh, onto feed pads and even indoors. Uh, this is not, in my view, the way forward. This, this is the tip of the confinement dairy iceberg, you put a, a shed beside a, a New Zealand dairy farmer's cow shed for putting his cows in in the winter, within 10 years, he'll have all his cows in there all year round, uh, calving 365 days and replicating what the US and Americans are, are, are 40 years ahead of us at doing. Um, their concrete, their steel, their, their equipment, their know-how, uh, their subsidies, um, as I say, they're 40 years ahead of, it, of us on all of it and it's not a path we want to go down. Also, we're in the business of commodities and ingredients in this country, and there's good reasons for that. But um, that is an, you know, another extra reason why we need to keep our businesses resilient because of the fluctuations and the volatility we experience in that business. We must retain a, a resilient farming model, no question. So acknowledging our ranking is slipping in terms of global competitiveness, uh, supply constraints out in New Zealand, and the competition getting better, Leads us off on to my third and final point. <coughs> How do we differentiate and grow the value of New Zealand milk? So my research this year has found ample evidence that milk produced from pasture is a niche in global terms and can occupy a premium position in a market. This grass-fed story is the opportunity for New Zealand to develop, to develop a new competitive advantage and protect their position as a milk producer. The grass-fed marketing proposition is very prominent and growing quickly, particularly in the US, in both meat and dairy. And all consumer research shows consumers are not only attracted to the grass-fed story as an animal welfare proposition, but also as a food quality claim. Many of the world's consumers are only really just starting to understand that all milk and dairy does not come from small herds mooching around outside on small family farms but the vast majority actually comes from large-scale industrial confinement for livestock facilities. Now, while these farms have few animal welfare issues, not all consumers like it, and the parallel is with, with caged tens, free-range hens, caged cows. Um, with confinement dairy, particularly in the US, there's also an association with the, the uh, feed industry, which, um, soy, corn, which is seen as increasingly uh, extractive and destructive as a farming system, particularly in the US. On the milk quality side of it, there's, there's clinical evidence which supports the fact that grass-fed milk is better nutritionally. We all know that it's more rich and creamy, but it's also higher in CLAs, omega-3s, and better carotene. And it does have improved functionality for cooking and baking applications. So these are all proven traits. Now, admittedly, some of them mightn't be significant from a human health point of view, but you could, have, you could probably argue the same thing about A2 milk. Grass-fed has a double proposition, animal welfare and nutritionally better milk. So how does the New Zealand dairy industry leverage this? Uh, this is our biggest challenge. I mean, we are commodities and ingredients in the main, and it's for good reason. We've got a seasonal grass curve. We're a long way from markets. Um, and moving up the value curve, although it's easy to talk about, requires serious investment in processing assets, brand development, marketing, and requires open market access for finished dairy products. And we, have, we don't have a lot of that 
in the New Zealand dairy industry. However, given the massive trend of global consumers seeking sustainably produced food, it is my prediction that the grass-fed segment will expand and become a relevant category. Global food companies will seek to increase product offerings in this space, and the New Zealand dairy exporter will be their go-to to provide claims around these products. In fact, this is probably our strongest point around, around this concept, is that very few global milk producers can chase us. Ireland may be the exception, but that's about it in terms of global milk exporters who are predominantly grass-fed in their production systems. So that in itself is a competitive advantage. So in conclusion, milk growth out in New Zealand is challenged. The volume model has run its course. We need to think more about value. Increasing volume from this point forward will probably be only achieved on concrete, and we cannot go there. We need to mitigate the environmental impacts of dairy and regain our social licence, but science and strategic management techniques, and again, not concrete, will be the way forward. We have to regain the trust and social licence because we can't take this high ground on marketing sustainably produced grass-fed dairy when we don't have a local domestic reputation. The competition is out there and getting better. For us, volatility we will continue and we need to be resilient. There is a significant challenge communicating to our customers about what grass-fed means and the benefits for the product, for the animals and for the environment. And I think we're quite understated in the way we do this now and it probably needs to change. While there is fantastic opportunity and potential for New Zealand milk out there in the world, it's all in the execution. It's going to take strong leadership and smart strategic decisions to move forward from here. And as farmers, we need to remember that most farmers around the world would change places with us tomorrow, given the attributes that we have created in the New Zealand dairy industry. We cannot lose sight of that fact and throw it all away. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a privilege.